If you've ever been on a commercial flight, you may have noticed on the seat in front of you, there's a pocket. And inside that pocket, you'll find a couple of things. One, the in-flight magazine. That's what most people read when they get on the aeroplane. There's another item as well, usually the paper bag. This is for when your stomach and the turbulence that might be on the flight you're on, yeah, you come to a disagreement. That bag is for that. But there is another card inside of the pocket as well. It's a laminated card. I don't know if you've ever read it before. This laminated card inside the pocket, this is the safety information card. And on this card, you'll find information about the specific airline that you're on or the specific aircraft, where the exits are, how to get out of it, but also information for how to get out and what to do if there's an emergency. If the plane lands on water, if the slides need to be deployed, if you need to somehow um, get into a position to brace, all that information is found there. Now, airlines take these seriously as well. And maybe you're wondering, well, why would they bother? Nothing can go wrong. When was the last time something went wrong? It's for just in case. I read a story a little while ago about a couple in Wellington who were sitting in an exit row. And if you're in an exit row, these are the people who will be responsible for letting others out, opening the doors if something happens. And they just refuse to look at the card and they refused to listen to instructions. It got so bad that the airline was forced to turn around on the runway, go back to the gate and unload the people because they were being so uncooperative. It's hard to imagine that you wouldn't take it seriously, but some don't. Why make such a fuss when nothing is probably gonna go wrong? Well, I heard another story a few years ago about an Ethiopian airline. It was hijacked. A hijackers came on board, three of them, and insisted that the captain of the airline, instead of flying to Kenya, Nairobi, where they were headed, wanted to be taken to Australia. Yes, all the way from Ethiopia to Australia. This plane was never gonna go that far, and there was not nearly enough fuel on board for the, for the flight crew to make the trip. The captain, knowing that he couldn't make the trip, decided to fly over water, but keep the plane as close to some land as he could. And knowing that there were some islands at about the point where he'd probably run out of fuel, had to crash land in the end, the aeroplane, onto the water. Now, thankfully, there were many people who actually survived this tragedy and survived this crash, but many did not. The reason though is interesting one, because many people as they were in the aeroplane, they put their life jackets in over their heads and they were ready for the impact. But many people, rather than just having the life jackets on, inflated the life jackets there inside of the aircraft. Now, when the water hit and the water started flooding into the plane, rather than being able to move out freely, the people who had their life jackets in, inflated already were, were trapped there. They were, they were pinned literally inside the aircraft because they hadn't read the, the, the card or they didn't know what to do. It was unclear to them what they should do. They, they had the safety equipment on. They were doing the right thing, you could say, but they were doing it in completely the wrong way. This is true of our faith as well. It's possible for us to do our faith in a way that's unhelpful, you could say. Some of us just assume, well, I'm in faith, it's all right, nothing can go wrong. I, I, know, I know where I am and I know where I want to be. But it is possible to get off track. If you've been following this series, maybe you remember part one where we talked about the flight path and we discussed how, as that story of Jeff went, who got on the plane to the wrong destination, he ended up being somewhere totally off course because he just assumed he was going in the right direction. In that message, we looked at how our motivations can take us off track and take us somewhere we never wanted to go. Jesus, however, also had something to say about this, but in a slightly different way. On one particular day, he was talking to a group of religious leaders and he was talking to them about a bunch of mistakes that they were making in their faith. He was trying to explain to them that even though they were on a journey of faith, they were practicing their faith. They were doing their faith in a way that was less than helpful. 
a little bit like a life jacket over the head that's already inflated inside the aircraft, Jesus was trying to warn them that there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. And today I'd like to look at these verses with you to see what we can learn as we're on our journey of faith as well. We find this discussion in Matthew 23, and we're going to start today in verses 1 to 3. Let's go there now. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. If you've ever heard the expression, practice what you preach, now you know where it comes from. Jesus is saying that the Pharisees weren't doing the things that they were telling others to do. It's a little bit like a story we might read in the paper about an elected official, someone in government or someone of importance, someone who is supposed to make the rules or who has made the rules, but then who breaks the very rules they've made. Why do people do that for them? Why do people not do what they expect others to do? Is it because they have a sense of being above it all or because they've made them, they don't have to keep them? Well, I'm a parent and I know that sometimes I fall prey to this as well. Sometimes I tell my boys, I say, look, boys, I want you to do this or that. And at times I've been taken back. I, I've been ashamed when my eldest son especially will call me out and say, dad, why do you tell us to do it? But then you won't do it. And you know what I've had to admit on many occasions? My son has been absolutely right. I have expected something from him that I haven't been prepared to do myself. You know, there's a word for this. There's a word in the English language that we use to describe someone who tells people to do things or something and then does the very opposite thing or fails to do that thing themselves. You know it, don't you? We say hypocrite. These people are hypocrites. They want something from me that they're not ready to do themselves. And in fact, when we come back now to Matthew 23 and verse 13, this is exactly what we see Jesus calling the Pharisees. Jesus said, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Don't think because Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites that he didn't respect them or wanted the people to disrespect them either. If you notice in verse one to three, Jesus even told the people, he says, you know these guys, these religious leaders of yours, do what they say, listen to them, respect them. It's so easy for us sometimes to pull down those in leadership, not knowing the load and the, the burden that they bear. What Jesus was saying was that these guys, often what they say is all right, but the way that they practice it and that the way they encourage you to practice it is totally off. That was the issue that Jesus had. He said, these guys are, are saying many of the right things, but they're getting you to do it in the wrong way. He said, they're applying their faith in the wrong way. Their position of authority, fine, respect them and, and take them seriously. Don't, don't denigrate that. But at the same time, realize that they sometimes, even as leaders, they get it wrong as well. This was the point that Jesus was trying to make. Sometimes in our efforts to get our faith right, we get it very wrong. And in fact, what the Pharisees were getting wrong was something that many people get wrong when they try to apply their faith and live it out in their everyday life. Jesus, after calling the Pharisees hypocrites in this section, goes on to pronounce a group of woes, seven woes upon the Pharisees. And as we look at these woes, we learn a lot about the kind of mistakes you and I can make as well when we're trying to live out our faith. And today, as we come to these verses, I'd like to look at woes four, five, and six with you as we pull some lessons out from them to learn for ourselves areas in which as we live out our faith, we might be tempted to go off course as well. We read about these woes in Matthew 23, and today we're gonna to start with woe number five in verse 25 onwards. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, 
but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. I don't know if you remember the old British comedy, Keeping Up Appearances. The lead character, Hyacinth Bucket, <laughs> or as she would have you say, Bouquet. The, the story centered around this lady who was all about making sure she looked right, sounded right. She wanted people to see her in a certain way. The funny thing about this show is that her family around her and many people who knew her were constantly reminding of her of who she really was. Her extended family was anything but upper class. And every time she tried to surround herself with the kind of people that she wanted to have influence with, often these family members would come into the situation and create a situation for her that meant that she wasn't able to achieve the status she was seeking for herself. Often she was not Miss Bouquet, Mrs. Bouquet, I should say. She was very much Hyacinth Bucket. <laughs> it's funny watching a show like this, and so many people enjoy a show like this, because watching someone pretend to be something they're not is humorous. And yet it's funny that so many of us do the same. We pretend to be something we're not. We, we try to cover up the parts of ourselves that we're afraid people won't like. We think people may judge us. We think people might look down on us. We, we're afraid of being embarrassed. We're afraid of being seen to be something that we know we are, but that we think others won't like. And so what do we do? Do we address the core problem? No, not at all. We do what the Pharisees did. Like Jesus said, they were clean on the outside, but dirty on the inside, like a tomb, white, but inside dead. We do a similar thing. We try to make sure that our outside looks great. We work on the parts of ourselves that are visible to others. We try to make sure that what people can see is great and the parts that they don't, we don't worry about. Like a newsreader, perhaps, who decides to get on TV in a nice, some nice clothing, a jacket, a tie, or a lady with a, a, a lovely blouse, but not wearing pants because the camera can't see. We work on the part that can be seen and don't care about what can't be seen because we're, we don't think that matters. Jesus said, though, that it matters for at least two reasons, and the first of these is that we're deceiving others. When we just work on the outside, when we just work on the parts that people can see, we're not being authentic. We're not being real. We're creating a picture of ourselves that's a, a construction. It's not who we really are. And the scary thing with the deception is that often we deceive others, but in the end, we can deceive ourselves as well. The second thing is, is that in this process of only covering up the parts that people can see, we're not really changing either. There's no progress in our life. Nothing's really getting better. We're just covering up the cracks. We're just patchwork. It's just a lick of paint. There's actually no real change. I often take my car in to get serviced. And the place where I do, depending on how good the service is, they'll often sometimes wash my car for me. Meaning that when the car comes back from the service, it looks brilliant. The wheels are cleaned, the bodywork is shiny, even it's had a sort of a clean inside, all of the carpets are cleaned, the dust is gone, the car's looking brilliant. The thing that's never crossed my mind, however, is that the, the place where I've taken the car to be serviced, they would just clean it for me. That they would totally forego changing the oil, cleaning the filters, and actually doing some work under the hood. It's never occurred to me that they would just skip that step. And yet, as I've thought about it at times, they totally could if they wanted to. I mean, I'm not a mechanic. How would I know? How would I know what's actually being done? All I see is the externals. I look at the car, I see that it's clean, and I'm satisfied with the result. This is the greatest temptation, Jesus says, in these woes to the Pharisees for us as well. There's this temptation to just change the externals, to just work on the outside, to make it look good so that others look at us and perhaps so that we feel good about ourselves as well. The issue with just working on the externals though, is it pushes us into a situation where we take on the task of changing ourselves by ourselves. It has this way of making our religion legalistic. And what do I mean by that? It, I mean, trying to save ourselves, trying to fix ourselves, we become the ones 
that are going to work on our own moral progress. We're going to be the ones that bring the change into our own lives. This is the temptation of trying to do it yourself. This is the temptation of just focusing on the outside. It becomes all about what I can do and not about what God can do in me. In fact, the Bible speaks about just this kind of thing. Come with me now to Isaiah 64, 6. And here we see described what it looks like when we are trying to be the one who does the good deeds, when we're trying to be the one that is trying to fill over the cracks and patch over the problems in our life, when we're trying to be the ones who are doing the good things ourselves. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Jesus' imagery of the tombs has a lot in common with what we've just read in Isaiah. In that picture, Jesus is picturing this life on the outside, this cleanness on the outside, but really inside, it's filthy, it's dirty. This is what Jesus is picturing here. And we've just read this again. This is what it looks like when we're trying to save ourselves. Even more so, when we put our energy into this place, when we're trying to look good on the outside, it means that all of our energy is only on the peripherals. It means that nothing's really changing. Even worse, others might look at us and think that we've got it together. Other people might try to emulate us, thinking that because we look good, they want to look the same and they start to do what we do. What's interesting here, though, is Jesus never asked us to choose between inward and outward. Maybe as you've been listening, you think, oh, well, the outward doesn't matter. No, Jesus actually said to the people that both were important, inward and outward. His point was that when it comes to righteousness, we can't start on the outside. If you want true righteousness, that starts on the inside. And from the inside, we work our way out. That's the first woe that Jesus said to the Pharisees. And the second now we will look at, we look at this in Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Maybe you've heard the expression, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. A similar expression goes like this. We say, we're majoring in minors. What Jesus is saying here is, is not that what the Pharisees is doing is unimportant. Notice his words. He even says, do it. What he says though, is that the things that they are focusing on, the things that they are making of primary importance, aren't necessarily primary. What he's trying to say is when it comes to our faith, some things are important, more important than others. And in fact, what Jesus is saying wasn't even the first time it had been repeated. He was harking back to ideas that came from the Old Testament. Let's read now Micah 6 and verse 6, and we read these words. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Notice the question that's being asked here by the writer. The writer's asking a question, how should I live my faith, God? How should I come to you? What do you want from me? He's offering different things. He's offering to to come with sacrifices. He even is offering up his firstborn child. He's trying to make the offerings big. And then the writer gets the answer. He, he, He realizes the answer. He says, you've shown me, God, what is good. You've shown me what you require of me. And notice the things, it's to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. God is after the person to live this life with them. Jesus is saying in Matthew 23, don't sweat the small stuff, guys. 
Don't get so caught up on the rules. Don't spend all of your time thinking about the minutia of your faith. Don't be so good at the minors that you totally miss the majors. This is why Jesus' illustration of the gnat and the camel is such a beautiful one in this situation. A gnat was this tiny little bug, like what we, we might call a fruit fly. The people at the time often would strain their drinks just to make sure that they didn't get a tiny little fly inside of the drink. And Jesus is making this comparison. He's saying, it's sort of like here you are straining at gnats, straining at fruit flies, making sure that you don't get this tiny little thing wrong. And then in your pursuit of that tiny little thing, you totally miss the big stuff. We can sort of say, missing the forest for the trees. It's something that we all do. We get caught up on little points in our life, areas that we want to make a big deal of. Jesus is saying in our religious experience, the very same thing is possible to happen. We can get so caught up on small areas, caught up on tiny points of our faith, to the point that we do it so well that we miss the big stuff. Maybe we're doing that stuff to cover for the fact that we don't want to do the big stuff. Maybe we're doing it because we don't have to want to address the big issues, or maybe we are just really missing it. Either way, Jesus is saying it's a problem because when you look at these two major woes that he shared from Matthew today, we notice one thing missing in both of them. Both of them mean that we don't have to do something and that is really change. Neither of these require us to have a changed heart. None of these require us to actually have internal change. Both of these mean that all the change that takes place in our life can just be on the outside. It's not that we shouldn't have a life that's well-ordered, that we shouldn't have a life where people do see us doing things that are great. Things like tithing, things like being generous, things like being people who do things that other people might even look up to, that's all great. But Jesus is asking, what's the source of that? Is that an internal thing? Is that a fountain that comes from within? Or is that merely a construction that you've built on the outside? and there's no real internal change in. That's the thing he wants us to realize. If there was a safety information card, if there was a card that we could read in order to make sure that our faith didn't go in a bad way, to make sure that our faith didn't get, go in a direction we didn't want it to go, that would be the thing Jesus would want us to know, that the inside is primary. And once the inside starts to change, the outside follows and not the other way around. Now, don't think that Jesus hated the religious leaders that he was talking to that day. Some people have read these woes and thought, Jesus didn't like these guys at all. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Jesus loved them. That was part of why he had these hard words to speak to them. He realized that these guys were the ones who were teaching the people how to approach God and he wanted them to see as he wants us to see that there are mistakes that we can make in regards to our faith that on the surface might look simple and that on the surface actually might make us look good but that underneath actually cause for us major problems in our faith. If we're working from the outside in rather than from the inside out, no real change can happen. That's why Jesus told us these things, because he wanted us to make sure that when we came to him, that we knew <laughs> which is the way to get out and which is the way to get in. He wanted us to know how to do it right. Come with me now to John 15 verses 1 to 5, as we look at what Jesus said was the secret to actually having lasting internal change. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Don't you love those words in John 15? The simplicity of them. 
What I found about the Pharisees approach and what Jesus was trying to unravel is that the Pharisees had found a way to make faith in God, not only superficial, but also difficult as well. It had no depth to it. There was no real change, but it was yet very hard to do. On the other hand here in John 15, Jesus paints this picture of himself as the vine and us like branches attached to that vine, connected into that vine, grafted in and, and with that life-giving sap flowing between. He goes to say that if we will be in that relationship, totally connected, totally in, totally with him, it's in that place that we find the ability to have those fruits, that, that good stuff burst from inside of us out. He goes as far as to say that without him, we can do nothing. And of course, we know that there's plenty that we can do without God. But it's this, it's this good stuff, this love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's these that Jesus says are the things that will come out of us when we have that vital connection. You see, it turns out when it comes to knowing God, it's not the outside that needs to change so the inside can, but the inside so that the outside. Can I pray for you today? Father in heaven, I wanna thank you that you've shown us how to live our faith. Lord, some of us have our faith like a t-shirt. It's inside out, Lord, or outside in. Lord, we wanna get it the right way. We don't wanna have a faith that's backwards. We want to change what needs to change, Lord, so that all of us can be changed by you. We thank you for this lesson we've learned from the Pharisees today. We pray that we'll internalize it and, and learn from it, Lord, so that we can get it right with you and not make the same mistakes that others have made before us. Be with us today, Father, as we continue to pursue after you and go on this journey with you. And we pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe today's presentation has left you with a few more questions than you have answers. Well, this is why we'd love to make a free offer to you today, the Walking with Jesus Guides. In these guides, we're hoping that you will be able to find some of the answers to the questions that you have and that you'll be able to dig a little bit deeper down to find out more about who Jesus is and what he's like. In these guides, we have a bunch of topics. Some of them include faith, what it's like to have faith and how do we grow it? What is it like to live with God every day, to have Jesus as part of your life and have him come into your life and others as well? To get these free offers, please visit our website, truthlink.tv forward slash Jesus or call us on 1300 300 389 and ask for the Walking With Jesus free offer.